Германского официоза. Догадаться, что на бумаге, конечно, они могут закрыть любое государство. Но если говорить серьезно, то все от них не зависит. Но, кажется, все от меня не зависит. Only once in my life I heard Stalin speak. I was suddenly caught up. I'm afraid in a kind of hero worship. There he was, absolutely calm. What impressed me mostly was the enormous pauses he allowed himself. That was power. It was the other fear. It was the magnetism of a boa constrictor. We were rabbits. We were magnetized. In the mid-30s, Stalin's revolution devoured its own children. From its national headquarters in the Lubyanka prison, the NKVD, the secret police, carried out an orgy of torture and murder. In a paranoid search for absolute power, Stalin liquidated everybody he thought might one day oppose the regime. No section of society was immune. At that time, it was thought that there were enemies who were working against socialism. And so, in order to carry out our policies, we had to have purges. As Stalin explained, we're adopting new aims, and those who don't believe in our aims, who can't or don't want to accomplish them, have to be removed. And so it was done. And we believed in it. One of Stalin's least explicable actions was the destruction of the army as an effective fighting force. Some 30,000 officers, including 90% of the army commanders and every single admiral, were arrested and in many cases shot. It is well known that Stalin always had a deep-rooted suspicion of the military. Even though the military had never attempted to assert itself politically in any struggle for power, Stalin was always wary of the possibility of the army emerging as a political force. So, to get Stalin to act, it only needed a few false allegations to be made about their unhappiness with his policies. A notable victim was Marshal Tukashevsky, commander of the Red Army and perhaps its most capable general. According to custom, his entire family was arrested with him. The men were shot, the women imprisoned. His sister, Elisabetta, was separated from her five-year-old daughter and taken to the Lubyanka. It was summer. The windows were open. The summer of 37 was very hot. And from 11 o'clock in the evening, the men started screaming, screamed in completely inhuman voices. I'd be trying to sleep. They didn't allow one to cover one's face with a cloth, and they kept an eye on us all the time through a peephole. So I'd block my ears. It was impossible to listen to. And to this day, I can't forget their screams. Every night, the bodies of Stalin's more important victims were taken to a crematorium and cemetery in the center of Moscow. There, the ashes were dumped in a common grave. The inscription reads, Common Grave Number One, Ashes of the Unidentified Dead. Why did we not reject Stalin? Why did we not turn away from his regime? In my case, there's a simple answer. 
There had been 1933, and Hitler had come to power. And in the Far East, the Japanese had conquered a large piece of China. And we felt both were deadly threats to us. Stalin needed friends. He formed alliances with France and several Central European countries, and he publicly supported collective security against aggression. In Spain, Stalin found that collective security existed only on paper. In 1936, General Franco led a rebellion against the left-wing Republican government. Franco was supported by Italy and also by Germany. Hitler provided the Condor Legion, equipped with aircraft and tanks. Stalin sent the Republicans food, aircraft, tanks and military advisers, but no organized units. France and Britain stayed out of the war, giving the Italian submarines a free run in the Mediterranean. I, for instance, brought 50 tanks across the Mediterranean Sea. You have no idea how difficult it was. Our ships were sunk, the Komsomol was sunk, so was the Sledovich and the Piatiletka, all of which carried tanks and food. All that happened with the silent connivance of that Empress of the Seas, Britain. So you see how Britain played into the hands of fascism. In 1938, Czechoslovakia mobilized its army in defiance of Hitler's threat to invade. To Stalin, the crisis was the final test of the Western powers' commitment to collective security. Stalin was bound by treaty to aid the Czechs, provided France honored a similar commitment. Whether Stalin would have fought for Czechoslovakia is disputed. Later, the Soviet Union claimed to have massed troops on its western frontier, but no independent evidence of that was ever found. However, there were some Russian preparations. At the height of the crisis in September, Stalin sent 20 bombers to Czechoslovakia and promised that 40 more would follow. Alexander Vetrov, then a tank commander, claims that that was not the only Russian move. We got the order in September to concentrate our forces on the border immediately to give possible help to Czechoslovakia. We moved there. I realized that we would have to fight. We uncovered our ammunition and loaded up according to the rules. The Munich conference proved to Stalin that he could not rely on the West. France abandoned Czechoslovakia and so did Britain. The Soviet Union's exclusion from Munich reinforced Stalin's suspicion that Britain and France would not object to German aggression as long as Hitler's ambitions were directed towards the East. Soviet propaganda films prepared the people for war more guns and even less butter and the transformation of tractors into tanks. In the summer of 1939, thousands of miles to the east, border clashes between Soviet troops and Japanese forces in Manchuria led to a short, sharp war. The Red Army had an exceptional general in Georgi Zhukov, and they had superior tanks and aircraft. 
In a spectacular armored attack in the Battle of Khalkingol, the Japanese were defeated. But Japan's presence on the Siberian border made Stalin feel highly vulnerable. The Battle of Khalkingol provoked alarm because it meant the threat of war on two fronts. Moreover, it was not clear who the enemy would be. It might be Germany, Japan and their allies, or it might be all the other Western countries. In March 1939, Germany occupied the whole of Czechoslovakia. Britain and France abandoned appeasement. They gave a guarantee of support to Poland, already under pressure from Hitler. But to give the guarantee teeth, they needed Soviet support. A joint Anglo-French mission was sent to Moscow, but the attempt to enlist the Soviet Union was half-hearted, especially on the British side. The negotiations with the West, with Britain and France, um, uh, yielded no results because actually those people who were at the at power, had power in, in London and in Paris, they didn't want to have an agreement with us. They were very anti-Soviet. They were very much interest is that Hitler destroys Bolshevism. Secretly, the Soviets were also talking to the Germans. While the Franco-British negotiations were dragging on, Hitler's foreign minister, Ribbentrop, arrived in Moscow to sign a non-aggression pact with Stalin. The marriage of Nazis and communists sent shockwaves across the world. Не только укрепит добрососедские и мирные отношения между обеими державами, но и послужит делу всеобщего укрепления мира. When the non-aggression pact between Germany and the Soviet Union was published, everyone was bewildered. We had always thought that Germany was enemy number one that is to say, German fascism. Attached to the pact was a secret protocol dividing Eastern Europe into communist and Nazi spheres of influence. Poland was to be partitioned. Stalin would take control of Finland, the Baltic states, and part of Romania. A copy of the document was found in 1945. It bears the signatures of the two foreign ministers, Ribbentrop and Molotov, and is dated August the 23rd, eight days before the outbreak of war. A few days later, Stalin invited a favorite of his, a 29-year-old general, to his study in the Kremlin to give him details of a new assignment. Stalin received us in his study. He greeted us warmly. He thanked us heartily. He said, we've had talks with the British and the French, but nothing feasible came from then. Then Ribbentrop arrived. He made a proposal or two and we came to an agreement. Then Stalin pulled out a map for us. You see that line? That is where you are going. This is Eastern Poland, or as we call it, Western Ukraine and Belarusia. That is ours, while the other side of the line goes to the Germans. And what are we going to get out of this, he asked? It will mean the end of reactionary Poland, which had always been a thorn in our side. That suits our interests to the full. What? Then we went into another room in which a banquet had been prepared. We spent most of the night there celebrating with Stalin, and he joined in the singing. Almost certainly, Stalin had several motives for choosing Hitler and not the Western powers. Hitler was offering Stalin territorial gains. The pact would give Stalin time to rebuild the Red Army. He's even said to have admired the German dictator, chiefly for the way he treated opponents. The relationship, I would say, they had never met, but some kind of spiritual, so to say, relationship uh, was certainly 
there. So this uh, uh, and the relationship somehow really probably influenced uh, um, Stalin with his idea of having some repression. 50 million pounds. 20 years from now. At that time, I was one of those who thought Stalin was a genius. For while we saw him as harsh as Ivan the Terrible, he was a statesman of genius. He had fixed the pact with Germany, and by doing so had kept us out of the war. On September the 1st, Hitler's formidable Wehrmacht invaded Poland. The brave but ill-equipped defenders never had a chance. Britain and France declared war on Germany, but did nothing to help the Poles. On the 17th day of the war, Poland was on the verge of defeat. Now the Red Army moved in, attacking the Poles in the rear from the east. After Soviet and German artillery had together shelled Polish positions, Red Army and Wehrmacht officers moved their units into previously agreed occupation zones. A map showing how Stalin and Hitler divided Poland between them survived the war. It bears the signatures of both negotiators, Ribbentrop on Hitler's behalf and in Russian script the signature of Stalin himself. Their plans dovetailed exactly. With unrestrained brutality, the Polish nation would now be destroyed. In Soviet propaganda films, Poles were being liberated from feudal rule, the estates of the aristocracy given over to the peasantry, with firm but kindly treatment for the dispossessed upper classes. <laughs> The reality was horrifyingly different. One and a half million Poles were packed into cattle wagons and transported to Siberia. Zofia Sulik was a schoolgirl, the daughter of a Polish general. The whole Sulik family was deported. We knew nothing at all where we are going to be taken. We were being arrested during the middle of the night, and that was all that we, we knew. We might have been shot, we might have been put in prison, we didn't know what to do, what, 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 what was happening to us. Russians, just like Germans, thought that Poland was a seasonal state and it had no right to exist and they've repeated that very many times after we were arrested. Not before, but after we were arrested, they kept repeating it that you, you, don't you dream about Poland because it doesn't exist and it will never exist. That's what they, they were telling us very many times. 13,000 Polish officers were also transported to the Soviet Union. After seven months in prisoner of war camps, they all disappeared. In 1943, the corpses of 4,000 Polish officers were discovered by the Germans in the forest of Katyn in Western Russia. The evidence suggests that they were executed by Soviet security forces in 1940. Stalin had taken Eastern Poland. His agreement with Hitler gave him control of the three Baltic states. He now demanded that Finland give him territory and naval bases to protect Leningrad. When Finland refused, Stalin provoked a war. In November 1939, he ordered the shelling of a Soviet border village and blamed it on the Finns. Stalin's opinion was that uh, with such a small country like Finland, it is just ridiculous to amass big troops. So he said only the Leningrad military region can, can cope with this uh, problem. And he was wrong. The Soviet troops suffered one setback after another. Whole divisions were surrounded by the Finns. Thousands of Russians froze to death or were taken prisoner. Mm -hmm. 
Finland had built solid defences, the Mannerheim Line. The Soviet generals ordered repeated suicidal frontal attacks. Red Army casualties were five times higher than Finnish losses. The Soviet Union's military shortcomings were not lost on Hitler. Personally, as a soldier, I reckon we only lost so many men because we weren't prepared for all this. We simply weren't ready. I either had to walk up to my waist in snow or go on skis. We didn't have any skis, and I myself can't ski. It was 50 degrees below zero, and we had to get through snow one and a half meters deep. Only an all-out effort by an army bigger than the male population of Finland enabled the Russians to win. Years later, Nikita Khrushchev was to say, a victory at such cost was really a moral defeat. But our people never knew that because they were never told the truth. In 1940, the new German-Soviet frontier in Poland was the scene of a striking example of Stalin's appeasement of Hitler. In March, a group of 150 German communists, who had been given asylum by Stalin and later purged and sent to Siberia, were suddenly transported to a Russian sanatorium. One was the widow of the German communist leader, Heinz Neumann, who had been liquidated. She and her companions were all in poor health. Also kamen wir in dieses, dieses Erholungsunternehmen, wurden vorsmedizinisch... After we arrived at this convalescent home, we were put onto a special diet, so that we stayed alive. At the time, though we didn't know about it then, thank God, we were to play a role in the growing friendship between Mr. Stalin and Mr. Hitler. This meant we had to be cosseted and fussed over. Und in diesem komischen Heim. Gott, what a joy it was to be in this curious place. Instead of the camp guards who bellowed at us, we were looked after by normal people who asked, how are you, or did you sleep well? We were speechless. Why this sudden change? After the German communists had been fattened up and given shoes, gloves, and fur coats, they were driven to the frontier. When we got to the Soviet-German frontier, we were driven across a rather unusual steel bridge. I was too worked up to notice the name of the river. Then the Russian secret police handed us over to the Gestapo. I felt this is the end. We'll never survive this. Mrs. Neumann had spent two years in Soviet prisons and labor camps. The Gestapo sent her to the German concentration camp at Ravensbrück. There she remained until 1945. Few of her companions survived. As well as their celebrated pact, the Soviets and Germans had signed comprehensive trade agreements with oil and raw materials flowing westward in exchange for German machinery and weapons. The Soviet supplies went a long way to weaken the effect of the British blockade and resupply the German war machine for the coming campaign in the West. In the spring of 1940, German troops entered Paris. They had defeated the French and the British in five weeks. The speed and extent of Hitler's victory in the West shocked Stalin. He had always calculated that Hitler might eventually attack Russia, but not yet. This um, defeat of France and the West came very quickly. See? Uh, when I've been thinking about the pact, 
uh, I uh, and many people were expecting that it will take a rather long time and that we will stand, stay out of the war maybe for months and maybe for years and they will be fighting and fighting there in the West before finally our turn comes. Less than a month later, Hitler discussed war against the Soviet Union with his general staff. He would be ready to attack in a year. <laughs> Stalin was hurriedly modernizing his demoralized army. To re-equip it with transport and modern weapons, he put factories on a war footing. Production soared. But not even Stalin could bring back to life the thousands of senior officers he had ordered to be shot three years before. The shortage of military leaders would soon make itself felt again. We lost our best officers, splendid officers. Without doubt, when the first calamity came, it was because our troops were young and had never been under fire. They did not know lots of things, because we did not have sufficient time to train them. So the destruction of our best people was a disaster. We would not have lost 20 million lives in the war if that had not happened. In the winter of 1940, a perceptible chill in German-Russian relations brought Foreign Minister Molotov to Berlin. This time, there was no meeting of minds. What chiefly troubled the Russians was the extension of German power on the Soviet Union's southern border. Romania had become a German satellite. Molotov told Ribbentrop this was a threat to Soviet security. To distract the visitor, the Germans offered a glittering prize in the east, India, announcing that Britain was on its knees. Molotov replied that he would rather discuss the present. On the third night of the visit, while Ribbentrop was describing the demise of the British Empire, his monologue was interrupted by the RAF. As Churchill wrote later, we had not been invited to the proceedings, but we thought it opportune to make our presence felt. I think that the British have amassed uh, everything they could. They knew that Molotov is in Berlin. They wanted to impress us, they wanted to discredit the Germans, because, you know, uh, Goering has said that not a single bomb will fall on Germany, but here there were um, uh, tens or maybe hundreds of airplanes flying over Berlin, and uh, Ribbentrop said uh, to Molotov, you know, it is not quite safe to remain here. Let's go down to the bunker. And uh, there was an elevator, rather deep, going down. Uh, the banker was rather well elaborated and very, very beautiful furnished and with gobelins and pictures, probably brought from France. And uh, so they were uh, continuing the talk and that's when uh, Ribbentrop again started to say that uh, Britain is doomed, that Britain will be soon destroyed. And uh, then Molotov said, uh, well, if Britain is doomed, then uh, why we're sitting here in the bunker and that uh, the bombs are falling, the British bombs are falling on the German capital. At the very end of the visit, Hitler made a special point of reassuring the Russians of his peaceful intentions. Before saying goodbye, Hitler stopped and said, uh, please uh, tell uh, Mr. Stalin uh, that uh, I consider him to be one of the greatest statements of our uh, age and uh, he will uh, get into history as uh, a, a wise and great uh, statesman. And then he said, I uh, hope and I think that I will also go into history and that is why uh, both of us should meet and this is Mr. Molotov, I ask you to convey to Mr. Stalin as my formal invitation for a meeting with him. Uh, this invitation was, as I think, another attempt to mislead uh, Soviet leadership and personally Stalin. Because when Molotov came back, Molotov reported about his trip to Berlin, he said that the foreseeable future, there will be no war with the Germans. Stalin believed him. And yet, all through the spring of 1941, 
the Kremlin was bombarded with warnings of a German military buildup on the Soviet borders. They came from Stalin's own intelligence sources and his frontline commanders. The most detailed reports came from Churchill. The British had broken the German codes. Stalin rejected all these reports as a British attempt to drag the Soviet Union into war. At that time, I was working in the Council of Ministers in the Kremlin. Stalin considered that London was up to its tricks and was trying to drive us into a conflict with Germany, and he was afraid of that. Marshal Zhukov, chief of the general staff, later recalled that he too repeatedly begged Stalin to prepare for a German invasion. Stalin said that he'd received a personal letter from Hitler assuring him that the German build-up had nothing to do with an invasion of the Soviet Union. Stalin definitely believed this. I at this time thought Stalin was far-sighted and a genius. I couldn't doubt that with his intelligence he'd seen to the heart of the matter. I believed in Stalin. What Stalin wanted was to uh, not to be involved in this war, to evade this war. He wanted not, this war not to happen. Of course, he also had been thinking that Hitler would never um, be prepared to get into a situation when he would have war on two fronts. Uh, war with Britain was not over, uh, so any moment he could expect invasion from Britain uh, in France or elsewhere, and in these cir uh, circumstances to start another war with the Soviet Union uh, would also be uh, very unreasonable. And uh, Stalin considered Hitler to be a very shrewd politician who would always calculate at all his steps, so he wouldn't do such a thing without somehow settling the problem of Britain. On the German side of the River Bug in Poland, Army Group Center was waiting to cross. It was part of the biggest military build-up in history. All along the Soviet border, from the Baltic to the Black Sea, Hitler had assembled four and a half million troops. Out of sight in the forests on the opposite bank, Red Army officers repeated their warnings to Moscow. They were told to relax. For those of us on the border decided to go fishing or even hunting. We had to keep our mouths shut. If we had accused our reconnaissance of doing their work badly, we would have been told not to raise panic, which meant we had to shut up. That was the trouble. If we'd been warned of the attack a week, or at least four days before it happened, we could have prepared our forces and the war would not have turned out anything like it did. The last Soviet newsreel before Hitler struck gave no hint of danger. The lead story came from the railway station at Brest-Litovsk, two miles from the border. The closing item was about a village fate. The Germans attacked at dawn on June the 22nd. They advanced at a rate of 50 miles a day. In the first hours of the war, 1,200 Soviet planes were destroyed, most of them on the ground. Hundreds of thousands of prisoners and tens of thousands of casualties were the price of Stalin's insistence on appeasement to the last. Such idiotic orders came through. Our planes had been destroyed in the very first days, and along came an order a day or two later to wipe out enemy planes. With what? 
We were half blinded by that pact of non-aggression with Germany, with Hitler's Germany. It seemed genuine. We believed in it. And the nation was misled. The main blame for this lies with Stalin. At the start of the German assault, Red Army commanders tried in vain to telephone Stalin. They were still under orders not to open fire on the enemy. It was several hours before Stalin agreed that this was war, and 12 days before he spoke to the nation. communists